Pulmonary edema is a fluid accumulation within the interstitial space and alveoli of the lungs. It is very important to know, according to the causes, pulmonary edema can be divided into cardiogenic and non-cardiogenic. First, let's talk about cardiogenic edema. Cardiogenic means that the reason of the pulmonary edema is dysfunction of the left side of the heart which leads to increased pulmonary capillary hydrostatic pressure. I will divide the patient's heart into the right and left sides. Here is the right atrium and right ventricle. And over here we have a left atrium and left ventricle. These are some alveoli. So the blood travels to the lungs via the pulmonary arteries which adjoins to the pulmonary capillaries where the gas exchange occurs. Then the blood via the pulmonary veins reaches the left atrium. When a patient has left ventricular failure, it means that the left ventricle is not able to pump blood to the aorta properly. In this case, the pressure within the left ventricle and left atrium will increase, which in turn increases pressure in a pulmonary veins. So blood, which is going back up, will lead to increasing hydrostatic pressure in a pulmonary capillaries. Increased capillary hydrostatic pressure pushes the fluid out of the capillaries and fluid first starts shifting to the interstitial space, then to the alveoli, and alveolar pulmonary edema develops. It is very important to note that pulmonary circulation is uniquely different when compared to systemic circulation. First, it is very low pressure system. Under normal conditions, in a pulmonary capillaries, the hydrostatic pressure is approximately 12 millimeters of mercury. Oncotic pressure is nearly 28 millimeters of mercury. If you consider these two forces, there should not be filtration because capillary oncotic pressure is greater than hydrostatic pressure. However, we do have filtration in a pulmonary capillaries. This is because there is a high concentration of protein in the interstitium. Well, actually, this is the second difference between pulmonary versus systemic circulation. High concentration of interstitial protein creates a very high interstitial oncotic pressure, approximately 19 millimeters of mercury. This is the force which promotes filtration. In addition, the reason of having such a great oncotic force in the interstitium is it pulls fluid in from the alveoli and keeps alveoli dry. It is very important to note that if you take a look at other places of your body, for example, let's take a look at skeletal muscle, edema develops here more rarely than it does in the lungs. This is because the interstitial space between myocytes is very tight there is a very tight space here available in which fluid can accumulate. As for the interstitial space in the lungs, it is wide when compared to other places. Even though it may become larger because normally the alveoli are empty and interstitial may expand its own space, filling this emptiness. Clinically, to confirm high pressure in a pulmonary arteries, we will measure pulmonary wedge pressure. This pressure is measured by inserting a swan gaff catheter into a peripheral vein, such as jugular or femoral vein. Then advancing the catheter into the right atrium, right ventricle, pulmonary artery, and then into a branch of the pulmonary artery. Just behind the tip of the catheter is a small balloon that can be inflated with air and we measure the fluid which is in the front. The balloon is then deflated and catheter removed. Normal wedge pressure in a pulmonary capillary is roughly 8 to 12 millimeters of mercury. 
The first patient sign in case of pulmonary edema due to left ventricular failure is often orthopnea. Orthopnea is dyspnea when supine because the chest causes additional pressure in the lungs. Orthopnea can be reduced or relieved with an upright posture. So about the treatment, I can say the following. In order to reduce the left atrial pressure, we have to use diuretics. It is important to note that the right ventricle also can fail like the left ventricle, but it happens very rarely compared to the left ventricular failure. When the left ventricle fails, blood goes up to the pulmonary capillaries, and when the right ventricle fails, blood will go back to the systemic capillaries. This leads to increasing hydrostatic pressure in the systemic capillaries, which in turn leads to the peripheral edema. So if a patient has both of them, I mean the right ventricular failure as well as the left ventricular failure, we call it congestive heart failure. In this case, all the veins in a body will be congested, either in a pulmonary capillaries and systemic capillaries throughout the body. Now, let's talk about non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema, which occurs because of direct injury of the alveolar epithelium or of the primary injury to the capillary endothelium. The causes may be divided into the exogenous and endogenous. Exogenous injury is due to gastric aspirations by breathing noxious substances such as chlorine gas or sulfur dioxide gas and it is also caused by trauma. Each of these cause direct injury of the alveolar epithelium and rapid leakage of both interstitial proteins and fluid into the alveoli. First, the rapid leakage of protein deactivates surfactant. When the blood flow to the alveoli is normal, but there is no ventilation because of the filling alveoli with fluid, it is called pulmonary shunt. The second factor, the endogenous factor that leads to the non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema commonly may include pneumonia and sepsis. It is very important to note that the sepsis first of all causes damage to the alveolar capillaries. As a consequence, the neutrophils leak out into the interstitium. These neutrophils cause damage to the alveolar membrane and the proteins with fluid leak out to the alveoli and causes pulmonary edema. Clinical signs are severe dyspnea of rapid onset, hypoxemia, and diffuse pulmonary infiltrates leading to respiratory failure. Another important point to note is that in case of non-cardiogenic edema, the pulmonary wedge pressure is normal or low. 